I'm going to um, ask you a little bit about um, your experience with that uh, in, uh, in terms of its relation to finding defects, finding defects within software programs. Can you share with me any, um, any components of this experience of finding, finding discrepancies here, um, uh, which might be thought of informally as, as a form of defect? Anyone want to share some aspects of your experience? Okay. It gets a lot slower. And okay. it gets even slower as time goes on. I found it came in waves. Like you do find some and similar, and then you don't find any, then you find some, and then you don't find any, then you find some. Okay, so I, I think these are cogent points. So let's let's explore each of these a little bit more. So um, so Jesse, you were saying uh, you thought it was easy at first and then harder. Do you wanna advance a uh, hypothesis why that might be? Because there's a lot of things that you notice immediately just by looking at the picture. Mm. Uh, depending on who you are, those might be different, but there will be things that you notice immediately. Mm. And then as you go on, because you're spending time looking at it, it kind of just blurs more and more. Mm. Mm. So like you, you keep looking and there's things that may be obvious that you miss. Like there was one that I looked at that I was like, oh, I should have got that ages ago, but I didn't. Uh -huh. I was, was looking. Okay. Do you think some of the things that you spot early might be more obvious things, and and then you spot more subtle things later, or or do you just think uh, a fair bit of it is just you get tired of it, and you know you get a bit fatigued, and you're not as no, you're not as aware of of um, a given level of obviousness. Uh, I think it's kind of both to a degree. Mm. Um, there are some things that will be obvious to you that won't be obvious to others. Mm -hmm. and some things that are obvious to others that won't be obvious to you. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll look and you'll notice those obvious things that are obvious to you. And then as you go on, the things that should be obvious in general maybe not as obvious. Okay. As you've been looking at so okay. So those are those are uh, welcome uh, comments, Austin. You you were saying things. You're finding things in waves. What, why do you think that might be? Well, the way I was doing it is I'd look for one type of defect, and then uh. I'd search the entire picture, and then I'd search for a different type of defect. And uh. the whole picture. Uh. Okay. And I'd kind of know that, oh, that one might be, but I'll get to it later. And yeah. Good. Good. Um, so you tend to find kind of similar types of defects yeah. in a burst, yeah. and then, then it takes longer while you look for another whole type of defect. Well, it's you basically exhaust the, or yeah. exhaust one type, mm -hmm. which you run out of, there's fewer of them to find. Right. And then you move on to a new type, and then there's lots of them again. Mm -hmm. Or there's more, I guess. Good, good. Others want to offer a any comment on that? That was exactly like him. Yeah. So they come in, in waves, you yeah. discover a like bunch six, that are similar. My sixth minute was zero. Like I had zero defects on my sixth minute. Yeah. And then from six to ten, I had I think five. Uh, yeah. that the, like, from you were on four a roll. To six, no, from four to six, I was looking at like a certain defect, and I found none because it was exhausted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting. And then the next wave, I just like yeah. Roll. Interesting. Anyone else? Um, I found less, and then more, and then less. You saw le fewer, and then more, and then less. Why do you think that might be? Do you want to um, hypothesize? I guess it took me some time to. Realized the defects, so mm. the first two minutes I only found five, uh, and then the next two minutes I found seven. So yeah. I guess I get to know more like how things are, and, uh -huh. and then one and one. So, so there was a bit of what what sometimes called a management science a learning curve. You you kind of learned how to recognize defects efficiently, and it sounds like you did that, Austin, um, and Mo did that for type of types of defects. And, and and that may be. So, what does this have to do with with defects in software programs? It's the same kind of pattern, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, what? Why might it be that things go in waves with software programs? So, for example, if Jesse's testing like just variables at that point. Yeah. Uh. He'll find a lot of defects for variables the first like hundred tests. Yeah. 
and then the, the defects are going to be so specific yeah. that it's going to be much harder to find. Mm. Kind of like uh, diminishing returns. Yeah, yeah, okay. So if he flips to another type of defect, he'll find a lot more. So mm. it's probably a good idea to like find the easy ones to find in each category first and then revisit and get right. really deep into every single one. Do you think they're good? Good. Um, do you think there could be, so that's waves, um, and uh, do you think there could be a phenomena where you find a bunch, earlier you said diminishing returns, you find a bunch and then it kind of tapers off and then you find a bunch more, good. Um, how about learning curves? Could there be learning curves associated with finding yeah. types of defects? Yeah. yeah, you become good at the tools, right? You become good at using whatever. GDB or, or Eclipse Debugger or whatever to find a certain type of, of defect or, you, you know, testing frameworks, right? Uh, whether it's with Nightwatch or Expresso or, or um, uh, you know, uh, JRobot or what have you, you're, you're able to, to test more effectively. So if you look at, so I, I like all these things. And these are coaching observations. I'd like you to, you know, experiment with another 30, uh, 20 minutes of that, so a total of 30 minutes. But if you look at um, empirical software projects, pro software projects that have been undertaken, you'll see very similar patterns. Same basic principles hold. This is from NASA, um, data on their cumulative defects per 1,000 lines of code for a certain type of project. Anyone want to guess what sort of project it is from these names here? Rocket? Yeah, so these are deep space probes. What do I mean by deep, deep space probe? These are the things that do what? Collect data? Yeah, they collect data. They're sent out into areas of the solar system, eventually reaching outer solar system. Voyager is outside the solar system now. I can't remember, Galileo I think may have gone to Saturn? Um, uh, Magellan was another probe. These things are sent out, they, they go you know, billions of kilometers uh, or longer. Um, and they're actually, uh, for some of them, like Voyager is loaded, there's Voyager 1, Voyager 2, but Voyager 2 is loaded with artifacts of humanity because it's the first human artifact that's gone outside the solar system and, you know, in another million years will reach other solar systems and it's carrying, you know, a record of people playing music and pictures of people and stuff like that. It's kind of cool, but the thing I want you to draw attention to is, is how the defects run within those projects. So what you see there is broadly reflective of, of what you were talking about. First of all, you see a bit of a learning curve here. You see it kind of started uh, green for Galileo. It, Galileo. it started a bit slower, then it sort of ramped up and slowed down a little bit. And then there's kind of this diminishing returns, right? Um, and then, wow, they found a bunch. and things come in waves. So you see sort of it going up and undergoing stasis for a while, no more defects found essentially than jump up. And similarly, you know, even for smaller periods of time. Now this is a long period of time. I mean, one year is, is somewhere in here, right? Um, so these, this is like over a year where no new defects were found here. This is maybe a month or two, no defects found. Suddenly they found a bunch. Then it went a bit slower, and suddenly you find a bunch. It goes in waves, and it becomes harder to find certain types of defects, and you find more. But a lot of the things also, you know, a lot of the biggest defects are found early, found earlier, and it takes longer to find each successive defect. It's like that. It's argued it's like that with oil wells, with oil fields. You know, the big ones were found early because you stuck down a pipe and a borehole and you find it, right? The small ones, the ones that are harder to find take longer, almost by definition. They're, they're more difficult to find, right? So finding defects is like this. And um, uh, testing is a sort of um, uh, hurry up and wait sort of situation where you go through, you you collect uh, a bunch and then it slows down, and then you can collect a bunch more. What's really important is to keep the creativity up. And this is one of the reasons bug parties are so valuable, because you combine a bunch of people, different ideas for how to test, and then you communicate them quickly. 
So if one person founds, finds a couple new defects using a new method, they can share it with everyone. And boom, you're off to the races. Other people you know, find it easy. Okay, now let's talk about stages in a system trouble incidence life. We, we talked about this a little bit before, but basically defects come into this so-called stock. It's sort of a, a, a count of undiagnosed bugs. By undiagnosed bugs, I'm referring to the fact that, it, by definition, you don't know how many of them there are. And that's introduced through new bugs, right? Mistakes are made. Problems are made, you know, added to the, to, the, um, uh, to the system. Maybe in response to fixing of other defects, that introduces new bugs. Or maybe it's just in, in normal development, new bugs are added. Through a process of testing, sort of work Jesse's doing, amongst other things, um, as well as through unit testing, you might find bug reports, right? Bug reports get filed. And do you remember what we said earlier, sanitization occurs? What's a sanitization process? I had a choice of two pop quizzes today. I could have given you a, one which asked about sanitization. What is sanitization? To make your program sane. Well, like to make sure that your program works the way you expect it it's to work. At, it in this case, it's yeah. Is it when you take your bug reports and like make them formal? Or yeah, like yeah. You you make it active right? reports. So it's sanitizing in the sense that it's sanitary. It's uh, um, it's uh, it cleans, cleaned. It cleans the bug reports. Reports for important details. Yeah, and for important defect, like for do you eliminate? Spurious defects, duplicate ones, outdated ones, misunderstandings, for example. Now, I, I will say that if you throw out a misunderstanding, generally it's not best to just throw it out. You might modify the documentation or you clarify understanding on the part of the stakeholder or you improve the online help system or something like that. You make it clearer in the system um, what's supposed to be done. but. The point is that a lot of the defects don't have to be fixed in the code base. And so you end up sanitizing ones that, they're spurious. I mean, they're, it's needless to have another repeat of it or one that's gone now. It was based on an earlier version because the machine they were on didn't get updated like it was supposed to. Now, this goes to the, after sanitization, it goes to what are called the active bugs, active defects. Now, often this pool of defects, this stock of defects, includes defects that are too risky to fix, too minor to be worth fixing this release, and defects that we just don't have time to fix right now. Why might we not fix a defect as we approach the deadline? We've alluded to it before, but I just want to be sure we're, we're clear on it. If you fix it, it's, it's the devil you know. It's the devil you know. Uh, if Good. If you fix it, you could get bugs that are even worse, essentially. That are what? Even worse. Even worse. And what's worse yet is you might not... Understand where they come from. Yeah, you might not know about them even when you ship product. Right. You might not, when you hand it over to a stakeholder, you might not be aware of it because you don't have enough time for another round of... That's bug testing, yeah, testing the system. And so you leave the defect you know in there because after all, a defect you know you can document. You can tell the stakeholders, set expectations, make sure that they know if this, this new feature, um, you're looking for feedback, it's, it's, not, it's not really solid yet, or you know, just don't use that menu item, just press the button instead. So you give guidance for, so they can work around it. And they'll shrug their shoulders off and fine, I'll avoid that, you know. Um, so here we're going back and forth. Um, here's Mo up here. There's Jesse. Okay, um, the testing process. Can he reproduce the failure? Um, is, 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 does the failure indicate a bug with the system or maybe a, a problem with the, the setup? and what factors influence it. And he's going to put that into a bug report. And here's Mo, right? Um, uh, what's the root cause? How can he repair it? Is this fixed properly to bug? He's going to release it back 
to to Jesse and Jesse's gonna find, okay, is the problem really fixed now, right? Does it pass the test now? It failed. Um, is that manual test that it failed now put in place in the form of an automated test, hopefully, so we can test automatically, is it now fixed, right? And we can test on an ongoing basis so we don't get a what? A begins with R, it has two S's in it. There's a G before the S's. Regression. regression. We don't get a regression without knowing about it. If we don't automate that test, then poor Jesse has to keep on running this manual test. But if the manual test found a defect once, you might as well turn it to an automated test so it can be run very quickly. Okay? Okay. So another concept I want to talk about is traceability. Okay. The idea here is, look, things are changing. Things change on projects. What things change on projects? Libraries use. Well, yeah. Okay, good. So maybe you you switch um, from Angular um, to to React, maybe, or something like that. You switch to Vue. Um, uh, for, as a as a framework, that might change. What else changes? What what else is going to change over the course of the next few IDs? What the stakeholder wants. Yeah, what the stakeholder wants. What functions are in place, right? Um, so sometimes stakeholder needs. Okay. Um, so look, often elements of the project evolve. User requirements evolve. They change. The user becomes more specific, clear about what they want pairs back suggestions earlier so that new other things could be folded into it within the time frame. Derived requirements change, maybe because of changes in technology. Design decisions change as maybe the system's too slow or too too flaky when the connection is is, um, is, is severed, so you need to change to a new technology or what have you. Um, and the testing focus changes. Um, the features change. And these one of the issues here is the changes lead to ripple through effects. What do I mean by ripple through effect? Well, a change, let's say, in requirements leads to subsequent changes being needed in the design, being need, and then that leads to code changes and test changes. Why do tests have to change, for example, when code changes? Sanity check. Why? Because code, if code changes, though, some of those tests might not be called anymore, right? Might not be useful. Yeah, so, okay. So you've eliminated a function. And you don't have to worry about the tests associated with it. You decide that feature we thought we were going to implement, we're not going to implement. How about another reason that uh, a code change might cause a test change? They may not make sense. Like, if you refactor code. Good. Uh, you need to also refactor your test, if that makes okay, sense. Okay, yeah. Accordingly. Good. If you pull something out that you were testing in this function, yep. now you have to call it a different way because now it's a That's different right. function. That's right. Even if you do something as simple as adding a parameter, a formal parameter to a method, do you think that might change code based tests that call it? Yeah. You bet it does. So, in general, there are these ripple through effects. Sometimes requirements change, leads to design change, leads to code change, leads to test changes. And that often can mean a fair bit of work. And, you know, the, the process of tracing these in our head is often challenging. So, the principle of traceability is luck. We have all these interlinks between requirements, which design elements depend on which requirements, which code elements depend on certain design elements, which tests depend on which elements of code, right? Makes sense, right? This code needs to call these functions, so it depends on them, yeah? So the idea here is, look, we have these interlinked things. They're, they're linked to each other in a structured way. And the idea of traceability is, look, document these linkages. Why might it help to document them? 
Okay, suppose a requirement changes. Why does it help that it's documented which design elements, which code depend on this requirement? For that matter, which tests, acceptance tests? Why does it matter? Why would it help? Because if you change something, yeah. then the code and the tests need to be changed to fulfill the requirement. That's exactly right. Yeah, so, so because this requirement changes, we know immediately because it's the, the link is recorded that these things have to change because of that requirements change. Does that make sense? Or Mo goes to update a certain part of the system and Jesse knows these tests need to be fixed or need to be changed, these integration tests. He knows immediately where to go rather than it just being something he has to think about and then maybe discover because the build breaks, the tests don't compile. Does that make sense? So it just makes it easier to track the consequences of changes. Mm -hmm. Because so much of software engineering is about managing the risks of change. Change is often painful in software, and we want to have ways to make it less painful. One way is by modularity, um, abstraction, abstraction by parameterization, or specification. Another way is through this traceability, okay? See, the idea is, look, you just record this test depends on these functions, or this function is tested by these tests, and it's a straightforward mapping, or this test, this acceptance test, this UI test, it tests these functions, right? Through, through the UI. That's good to know because it gives, points you immediately to what has to be changed, to update it when you have a change, say, in requirements. Okay, now, one thing we've talked about this that I just want to come back to, make sure it's clear, is something you've already been investing in. Traceability in the form of a test matrix, right? This links, what does it link? Well, test cases with functions or requirements or modules, features. So you might have this. Here's a bunch of features, here's a bunch of requirements. Here's a test case that is linked to these. What do I mean by linked? If there's an X here, test case here has an X for features. What does that mean? It means it tests that specific feature? Yeah, so this feature is tested in this test case. Maybe this test case is a use case, which uses that feature. Does that make sense? And we make sure this feature is working through this test case. Test case two could also test this feature. Does that mean these two are redundant? The test case two isn't needed? No. Why not? Because it has a different requirement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, first of all, it could, it, it's implementing, it's testing requirement three, whereas test case one is only two. Could you imagine a test case that's testing all the same basic requirements and features, but it's still not redundant? Yeah. How? It could test a different subset of things. Yeah, yeah, it could test it with different data, with different example input, right? Yeah. So you might sort these numbers, or you sort those numbers. Maybe in one case, it's the numbers are all things you know greater than zero. Other cases, they're a mixture of negative and positive and zero. Maybe in another case, they're dates. It's testing the same feature, it's just testing it with different data. Is it, are those redundant? No, most certainly not, okay? Um, so this is an aspect of traceability. Traceability is not something super fancy. It's not, also not something that has to be captured in text. It can be captured in a simple thing like a table. Testability is good, and I would like you to make use of it. We can, of course, using this, identify coverage gaps. We, we argued this before, right? Test matrices allow you at a glance to see are there some requirements that aren't currently tested by any test? Are there some features that aren't tested? This is another benefit of traceability. Does that make sense? Tracing what things depend on what buffer you from change. Sure, it says what things, okay, this requirement gets changed, these tests 
may need to be updated or this feature is changed. We split feature four into feature you know, five and six. What tests might have to be modified, yeah? But another thing you can do with traceability is spot gaps. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. These things are good. So, some suggestion for testing, you know, for tracing, design elements and requirements. If you have a formal design document, being clear which elements of the design are to fulfill which requirements um, is good. Code and any design elements, tests and code, this is key. This is very, very valuable. Which tests, verify which code. Which code is depended on by those tests. And for acceptance tests, these test requirements or other system tests, the test use cases depending on requirements, we should have that. So really this is not just acceptance, but it's also system uh, and uh, acceptance tests. Okay, there we go. Okay, is this much clear for you? Is that, is that clear? Okay, so these things are good. I, I love test matrices and I, I like seeing them and think about them as an asset from the standpoint of traceability. From the standpoint of asking what needs to be updated if there's a change and where are the gaps? Yeah? Okay. We talked about this a little bit. Defect reports, ladies and gentlemen. Defect reports. When you have an issue tracked, like with GitHub issues, you're gonna to wanna to think about certain types of information. Traditional ones are listed here, a short title. And most importantly, for in terms of numerical assessment of its priority, triaging it, figure out if we're going to in fact fix it, queue it up for fixing by the developers. Go through the triage process. This queues it up to actually be fixed. These are active bugs. These are defects that include some that are too risky to fix, too minor. To, to promote it to important bugs, it goes through triage. And one of the things we use to triage it is priority. And I want to distinguish here between these two things, priority and severity. Priority indicates how, how important is it to fix. Severity is how serious of, is it if it occurs. Can you give me something? So if it occurs is severity, how bad is it? So can you give me something that is highly severe but low priority? The internet is destroyed and is never coming back. <laughs> okay. Good, so that's something that is bad, especially to your generation. Um, <laughs> but, so it's very severe. Is it, what, what makes it unlikely to be high priority? The likelihood of it, the likelihood happening. Of it happening is very, very, very low, right? Um, okay, give me something that's high priority but low severity. something that's got to be fixed. It's consequence, how bad it is if it happens. Like, you it, it's not like you lose data. It's not like the system becomes non-operational. It hangs, it the crashes. The title on the main screen is spelled wrong. Yeah, the title on the main screen is, is spelled incorrectly, or the, the sponsor's name, right? You misspell WABA. It could happen, right? That would not be good, right? Um, uh, so, things can be high priority but low severity. Severity is very high for things like crashes, things that involve data loss, things where it hangs, things where it becomes permanently operational. These are bad, bad things. But with priority, we temper them, an understanding of them, with an understanding of how likely they are to occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's a basis on priority that typically that's the foremost consideration. Do we fix it? Is it a must fix? Is it will fix opportunistically? So this triage 
it's often undertaken based on priority. So in a system, you'll have priority one bugs, priority two. Priority one is the highest priority. It may sound odd, but it's high not in a numeric sense, but it's the top of the priority queue, the, the, the highest priority, it's the very top of it. Um, but in addition to these things, priority and severity being assessed, often there'll be a reproduction formula. How do you reproduce this? Who it's assigned to? What area of the project? Is this a back end thing? Is it a, you know, a front end issue? Is it a database issue? What have you? Who opened it? Who reported it? And then, you know, is it active? Is the developer market is fixed. Has it been marked as resolved by the tester or or person reporting it? And is it a permanently closed defect? Okay, um, is it a regression or is it a regular bug? And um, uh, triage, so uh, basically here, are we going to fix it given limited time? So this triage process is basically figuring out which of these we actually promote to be fixed, to get it in the queue for Mo and his legions. Okay, now there's a process called directed triage, which is quite distinctive. With directed triage, what happens is that typically it's the project manager and often either the test manager or the dev lead, they get together as a deadline approaches. And they go through the set of active bugs and they figure out how are we doing? If they don't have priorities or severities assigned to them, they, they figure them out. They, they take a look at it, if necessary, reproduce it and assign their priority and severity to figure out how are we doing? Where, where are we? This is a data collection exercise, directed triage. That's what it's called. So it's wading through these active bugs to figure out how we're doing What's our technical debt? How, how much do we have to fix here? It's actually not quite technical debt, but it's related to it. Um, what do we have to fix? Um, and what things do we not have time to fix? Because if you don't have a sense of what's in the active bugs, it's hard to know, are we going to have a soft landing? Are we going to be able to finish things in time for the deliverable? not just for this project, this is for stakeholders in general. Are we going to be able to finish it in this scrum, in this sprint, I should say. Um, and uh, you're going to go through, figure out where you're at. Okay, how many priority one bugs do we have? How many priority two? And on the basis of that, you're going to figure out which of them you're actually going to fix. You're going to triage them. Does that make sense? So it's a data collection exercise and it can involve this promotion of things for a triage process to figure out which things are we going to fix, which things are we not going to fix. Just take them as the devil we know. Okay. Okay. So creating a good bug report, I've alluded to it earlier, but I just want to talk about some of the steps here. When Jesse sees a failure, or when one of you sees a failure and wants to report it, don't just, don't just say, you know, system failed, whatever. Try to do a structured exploration, okay? Try to explore it in a way that you figure out how you can reproduce it as what as possible, as begins with an S, as an L, as a P, as an Y after the L simply as possible. Look, Jesse may be banging this system. He's been using it for 20 minutes now. And suddenly a defect comes up when he happens to use a certain feature. He could describe everything that's gone on in these 20 minutes, but a lot of it might be redundant because maybe he could get it to crash in the same way within the first 30 seconds by going through the final two steps of that. Maybe, maybe not. But the goal is to try to 
try to narrow it down what, what has happened there, to try to make it reproducible, make it so he can demonstrate it with confidence and certainty it's going to happen. Maybe initially it only happens erratically, but once you really nail it, it happens every time. Maybe it, you just need a slow connection or something like that. Now, part of this is stripping away unnecessary things. That's part of make it as simple as possible to, to, to reproduce, right? You strip away unnecessary steps. You say, I don't need that. I don't need that. It's all just about scanning this code and then saying, you know, I want to click on first to see their picture and then I want to click on their background interest and then in their picture again. A boom. Dies. A horrible death. Okay. Now you've boiled down to a thing that's easy for Mo to reproduce. Why does it matter it's easy for Mo to reproduce? Why might it be really helpful for it to be easy? To trace it? To yeah. To, what it uses. to trace it and to... Fix it. Yeah, to fix it, to debug it. Yeah. I mean, if it's really hard to reproduce, it's painful as all get out. You go, you step through the debugger and it never happens. If you can reproduce it every time, now you're cooking with gas. Now you can track it down. You just have to set those key breakpoints, fire it up in a certain way, ba-boom, happens, boom. Um, you know what's going on. Null pointer, boom. Okay. Um, now, another thing that's really useful to do, I say compare with other versions and features. What do I mean by compare with other versions? Um, previous release version? Yeah. Why, why would that be relevant? After all, you're trying to debug this release. Why is it relevant whether it was also occurred in last release? Because if it wasn't there, then it's something you implemented between the last version and this version. Yeah, and that could be useful for what? Tracing? Yeah, for debugging, yep. right? Because now you know, okay, the only thing that's changed between this time and this time is this module that's at all relevant to it. And so it might help you figure out what's going wrong, develop hypotheses, where to put the breakpoints, where to look first, right? So you should have access to older versions. You might want to look at other features that are related as well, you know. It's, if there's a related feature, can you reproduce it with that, right? You want to summarize it, make it easy for Mo to read late at night or whatever. Not have to wade through a lot of text and graphic, you know, pictures, but just a, a, a smaller set of things, nice crisp description of it. Disambiguate, neutralize it. No jabbing. No jabbing him yet another bug with the scanner. Um, no, no, none of that. And then review it. Often you can get other people to review it. Okay, um, now in terms of reproducing bugs, we talked about this last time in passing, but the idea here is that look, if you're running a test, you don't want that test to change things in a way it'll make it impossible to run it again with exactly the same conditions. So. If you have to manually copy the data, so you know you're going to be able to start with the same starting point in terms of the data you have access, you know, the database or whatever, do so. Don't let it be destroyed. You know, you scan something in and it changes the state of the database. And after that, you can never reproduce it because the database has been changed. Instead, try to make a copy so it's, you're starting from the same starting point. That will aid reproduction. Okay. If you're conducting exploratory testing, try to write down what you're doing, Jesse. Try to record. Maybe use a screen recorder. It's not a terrible idea if you can use that flexibly. You can replay the last 10 minutes if, if that's an easier way to do it. Just be aware sometimes it's easier to just write it down. Okay. Um, yeah. Just out of curiosity, if let's say Jesse has like a system of tests yeah. that start at one point and like they kind of loop back to where they started. Mm -hmm. So for example, if he's like testing add, delete, 
yeah. date, and he just keeps doing that until he kind of gets back to where he was. Yeah. Is that you, a good idea or a bad you idea? You mean like, so you add and then you delete, for example, to make it a particularly so simple say, zone, and then add the, another. The other way around, so let's say like, the Jesse's in the, like the name Jesse's in the database, then he deletes it, then he adds it, then yeah. he updates it, then he updates it again back to Jesse, mm. and then he checks for it, and then he just keeps doing that until he kind of gets back to where it started. Mm. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? I mean, it, it can be okay. I mean, I, I don't discourage that. I think that's one good test scenario. But what you might look for there would be particular types of things. Like you might look for, in some languages, you look for a memory leak, right? Like memory is growing. <laughs> if memory is growing in that process, you do it 100 times in an automated way. If memory, the memory usage is just growing, 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 you've got a problem. It could be useful for, for discovering that. Um, it can be useful for comparing. Is it stateless? When I say stateless, what I mean is, I've seen this before, um, comparing the registry, the registry, sorry, I'm just thinking back 20 years to a consulting engagement I had where they were doing this sort of thing. Someone told me a freaky thing about the Windows registry. Basically, if you added something and deleted it, it's changed, um, which is, is freaky. But the idea is you could compare the database before and after this process. It should be the same if you're going back to the same point. Is it the same? If it's not the same, something's probably broken, right? Like, because the database contents are different. It should be back to the same. So that can be useful as one test case, but it shouldn't be the only test case. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering if it's a yeah. good idea to have that like. I think it's a I think it's a nice idea for a couple test cases, sure. I don't I if if that were the only test case, there'd be lots of room for growth. Yeah. 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 Um now the containerization revolution um makes this process of reproduction, it's sort of copying data really, really easy. Basically with traditional process you kind of prepare you, you prepare the test, you execute it, you evaluate the response, then you restore it back to its restored state. It turns out with containerization, a container completely describes what's, what's in the container. So every time you fire up this container, it's with exactly the same starting point. It's like a system emulator that, it's not quite, it's, it's actually more efficient than that, but it's like a system emulator that's exactly back to a defined state. More than that, it actually completely wraps up its dependencies. It completely encapsulates what it needs to do its job, which means if I run it on my Mac and you run out your of uh, your Linux box, then we will actually have exactly the same experience. It doesn't matter how many libraries I have installed, what libraries you have installed, which version of Linux I'm running versus you. Um, if if Ecrom is running Windows with this, all of that's encapsulated in the, in the container. So you don't have this issue that, oh man, these test machines have been updated to the latest version of Windows and these ones are still running the earlier version. It's not really the same test environment. This is a lot of what DevOps has had to deal with. We might have a lecture on DevOps down the road. And containerization helps us deal with those dependency issues and it helps us deal with reproducibility. And this is why one of the reasons it's taken the world by storm in terms of a test framework, because it allows me to test and you to test in exactly the same environment and to do so totally reproducibly. Does anyone, have you encountered containerization in your other classes? Yeah. What, uh, what framework? Docker? Rocket? Docker. We talked about Docker once. Is this yeah, in? Yeah, this, like very briefly. Though. Is this in like web programming? Yeah. Or? With uh, Professor Dieters? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so containerization is is a technology that's very important now. If if you want to get a leg up on a technology, very likely you'll be using, uh, once you leave to the workplace or within your first job or two, containerization is a very good one. And I would play around with it. It's really easy to use. There's containerization um, resources in the form of container repositories that you can go download and they have you know pre-configured a set of software you don't have to configure it that's the beauty of it you just get this container all the software is 
is pre-configured in it. MySQL is linked up to, you know, is linked up to, to uh, Python and to um, uh, this uh, bootstrap library or what have you. It's all pre-configured. You don't have to worry about configuring it yourself. Okay, so what are some problems with re reproducibility? If, if you had to think about why might a bug not be reproducible if executed outside a containerization, outside a containerization framework, why might a bug not be easily reproducible? What would you say? Give me a reason. You've done too many steps between like what you've recorded. Okay. Um, so maybe there's some variability uh, in those steps somewhere. Could be, although if you're careful about the order. But what might not you control about the steps? Imagine it's a GUI system. Could it be the timing of those steps is important in some cases? How long it is between clicking this and clicking that? In some cases it could be, right, performance-wise whether it's written it entirely to over the network or to disk, right? Um, could what, what else might prevent reproducibility on a common basis? Well, here, uh, if it occurs, sometimes you get a bug, it only occurs the first time it's run. What is that an indication of? Permissions? <laughs> sometimes it can't be permissions. That's if it only occurs the first time, yeah, it could be a permissions issue, yeah. It could be a sign that you're not re reproducing the state, getting going, rolling back the state to the original one, right? Different developer and test environment. How could that prevent <coughs> reproducibility? You have a different environment. You're kind of just, mm. it's, it's different. So when, yeah. you want to, when you're trying to reproduce the same thing, you can't. Good. It's just something. Okay. So Jesse might be running it with one system. You're running it with another. And Mo, you can't reproduce this bug that he found because he's running a somewhat different version of Firefox or running a different version of Chrome. Could that happen? Yeah, yeah it could happen big time. This is one of the reasons containerization is this great leveler. Within the container, you have exactly the same version of Chrome installed. And no more of this, well, he has this on yours and he can't update his system to the latest one because it's going to break this other test environment that he has. This, this operation's hell, okay? Um, race conditions. What do I mean by race condition? Um, two things happen at around the same time and one just happens before the other. Yeah, it just happens. It happens to happen. It, it just by chance... A occurs before B. So the user clicking next and when the file is finished writing to disk or over the network or what have you. Um, maybe if one happens first, things are fine. If the other happens first, it's problematic. Okay. Um, forgotten external details. Maybe there's some aspect of the environment that you haven't been considering. Maybe it's... Um, the disk is full, right? Um, or near full, it's near capacity. Um, you did something unintended and forgot. In the middle of reproducing, in the middle of your steps, you, you actually switched over to your email. Uh, or you, you did a system update, or, or you, you know, uh, maybe uh, did a pseudo in a, in a different uh, different window to access something. The bug changes the state, again, dealt with by restoration, by restoring the state fully. Um, heap fragmentation, the heap is so fragmented. You folks probably don't remember this with C, but if you allocate a lot of things in the heap and then deallocate, you may think it all goes back to a fine state, but you can be in a situation where you allocate n bytes. You free them all up, or say you free up n minus two, and then you can't allocate a big thing because the heap, the heap, this area where you could allocate things out of is divided up now into sub pieces, and you can't allocate a really big thing straight and see. This is this occurs. You can't move it or it can't 
be intelligent enough to move around what's allocated to make space for this thing. Um, cascading failure. One thing causes another, for example. Or it's time dependent. It's resource dependent. The machine is somehow disrupted. Um, um, there's some sort of delay associated with the network or, or the disk or the tape or whatever. And finally, that hobgoblin of software developers, it's a hardware problem. Don't believe it. Don't believe it until you, you find, um, find things with great confidence. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about what things could help you summarize the progress of testing. Often you'll have some tests in particular areas. We have one system that went commercial about five years ago. At the time it went commercial, it had 900 tests associated with it. So we had many, many tests for each area, for many areas of the system. And when you have those tests, you kind of group them by areas. And you might express, you know, um, how many of those tests run completely? And then what's the percent that actually pass their tests, okay? Um, how many run actually to conclusion, get all the way through the test, and to what degree are they successful, okay? Um, so here, for example, is a case of a, there's, there's all these tests that run, great, but just short of 90% are successful. In other words, they match up with what's expected. Here we have, a smaller number of tests that actually complete, but of those, 100% are successful. You can distinguish these. And you should think about, if you're summarizing where you're at, if Ekram wants to summarize where things are at in her system, she could specify the number of system trouble incidents, number of active STIs. Remember, those are these ones here, right? Active defects. And it has eliminated those who are sanitized, eliminated duplicates, eliminated outdated ones, obsolete ones, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, uh, percent of tests that are complete, um, uh, percent that, that pass, okay. Um, this defect age at closure, a project your size, I don't know how necessary it is, but basically what it summarizes is how old are defects when they get closed. Why might you want to keep track of that? Suppose defects are really old, like four weeks old by the time they're closed. What's that assign that? Um, it took, like, how long it took to fix the bug. Yeah, can be bug, or maybe there's not enough testers. There need to be some more testing resources put at it because these defects are sitting there for a while. It could be it's a sign that the defects are challenging to debug. It could also be a sign they're circulating among testers, hot potatoes, that just tossing it to the next one. Could be they're also low priority. Could be, yeah. So defect age of closure for priority one bug, if that's four weeks, that can be a problem because it's, it's, a, it's a very, very important bug. Whereas a priority three or four bug, maybe it's a minor thing. You fix it when you see fit. Um, uh, number of defects opened and closed. And I want to remind you that if you, if you have defects, number of defects found and number of defects fixed are they, they're what we call flows. They flow into a stock. Jesse will maybe recognize this terminology. So what I mean by that there, whoa, that there are flows, whoa, okay. Um, what do I mean by their flows? They're, they're, they reflect changes in those defects. Some new ones coming in and some ones that are fixed flowing out. If, if we go back to this diagram, basically fixed, might flow out, well actually it would be here. They're flowing out from an assigned developer. They believe they fixed it. Whereas ones that are discovered flow into the developers. And if we think about the total number of defects as having flows in, 
as new ones are discovered and flows out as defects are fixed. When is the number of defects that are known going up over time? So consider a week. We have N defects found and M defects fixed. Under what conditions will the number of defects at the end of the week be higher than it was at the beginning of the week? When N is less than N? Good, yeah, when N or conversely when N is greater than M. If the number of new defects found is greater than the number of defects fixed, you're having an accumulation. Does that make sense? If I, if I have 10 new defects found and five fixed, how many more defects do I have net at the end? Five, five right? 10 minus five. Mm -hmm. So what's going on at this point? If, if, if uh, this blue is defects found and cyan, magenta, excuse me, is, uh, is defects fixed, what, what's going on during this time? Between weeks 10 and 14, if I see correctly. Okay. They're in like a, they're in a good state. Okay, what's happening during that time between like? They're going over, they're, they're fixing more than they're finding. Okay, so what's the number of defects that are known is gonna go down? down. How about this early phase? They're in a very bad place. <laughs> Okay, well, I would argue this is actually more typical of early stage. Yeah. What's going on here? They're finding a lot of you're, the main surface bugs. Yeah. And they're just slowly getting... You're, and you're slowly working through them. Yeah. And they have a very large spike of fixed yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. And yeah. found in the beginning. It's just normal. Right. And here we might be limited by the number of developers and the number of testers. They're finding a lot of really easy to find defects maybe. So they're accumulating. But meanwhile, the, the, test, the, the developers are working through these, fixing them side by side by side until they, the number of found starts to exceed the number of fixed. And now the number of stocks of bugs is going down. So it's going up. The number of bugs that are known is going up here. And then it's reaching its maximum here. At these two weeks, is the number of defects that are known going up or down? Uh, equal. Like yeah, the same. it's the same. It's, it's the same because we have, say, five found, five fixed, right? And then it starts going down here, right? But it takes a while to drain that number that built up here, right? There's this period of imbalance to address and we need a period of imbalance here where the number fixed is greater than the number found. So tracking the number opened and the number closed, Ikram, could be good. How many defects have been found in the past week? And how many fixed? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So you get a sense of, of uh, you know, are, are we growing the number of known defects or is it shrinking? Are, are they accumulating? Or are we draining them over time so much that the number is coming down, right? Um, so I mentioned directed triage earlier. It's a data collection process to figure out which, what priority of bugs are out there. What are these bugs like? How severe and how high priority are them? So we can figure out which do we want to fix, okay? And this is often undertaken in the later stages of a um, deliverable. Okay, now, the time has come for us to shift gears, to have a changing of the guard. I have invited two people here who may show up, um, uh, people helping me mark this uh, course, um, and they may show up here in the next few minutes. What I'm going to do is to make myself scarce for a few minutes, okay? I'll give you about 10 minutes, get your ducks in order, and, uh, and then I'll return, and I will hear from you. And if you all walk away and I come back and no one's here, that won't be good, <laughs> okay? Okay. And Jay's not able to make it to this either. No, he said he was not able to make it today. Okay, okay, thanks for letting me know.